Intel is fixing their own bent CPU motherboard situation, Epic Games is getting on iOS, and ASRock, Gigabyte, and Zotac, naughty. Shame on, stop it. Let's get into the hot news, everybody. I'm your Brett host. We're gonna be going over the hottest tech news that I can find on the internet while you enjoy your breakfast this Monday, July 8th, 2024. We're gonna start off today talking about the reports that Intel is gonna be coming out with their own contact frames for high-end motherboards on the next generation Arrow Lake chips. So this is something that has been plaguing the 12th and 13th and 14th gen CPUs in that when you put a CPU cooler onto the LGA 1700 socket, it can cause the CPU you to bend in the middle, causing issues for the actual contact of any sort of thermal paste or making sure that you're getting proper cooling. Now, this has been addressed by enthusiasts by using a product known as a contact frame, which helps to make it so that it doesn't bend. Or you have companies like Noctua, who just released their NHD 15 version 2 that actually takes into account the convexity of the CPU and make it so that you get better contact in order for the cooling to happen. But instead, what's going to happen now is that the next generation motherboard should have their own reduced load ILM or independent loading mechanism, which allows them to be more rigid, more stabilized and not necessarily bent. However, this reduced load ILM will likely only make its way to the higher end motherboards, especially since it's going to cost a little bit more to implement a dollar. It's going to cost a dollar more, which is why they're not putting it on low end boards, because that means that they would have to upcharge it by a thousand dollars, right? You can't you can't increase the cost a dollar without increasing increasing your margins exponentially more. So you, you have to, you can't put it on everything. Obviously, this is a decision that's gonna be made collaboratively with Intel and the motherboard manufacturers. I said it like that because I was gonna trip over my mouth in order to say it, so I just did it weirdly. It's a good thing that's being fixed. It's only gonna be for the high-end boards and enthusiasts were kinda already changing this themselves. It does make sense if you're on like an i3 or an i5 and it's not an overclockable chip. It, your contact on your CPU cooler is probably gonna be fine enough where you're not really noticing it, but when you're on that high thermal power, you're trying to draw as much as you can out of the chip. It makes sense. Those are the customers who are gonna benefit from this more. But speaking of the more mid-tier customers, it turns out with the next-gen Arrow Lake CPUs, at least with the core ultra, Series 200 or 300, I, I don't know what they're gonna name it. I don't really like it either way. Anyways, the point is that the i3, the Ultra 3, whatever it's gonna be called, is not going to be based on the next-gen architecture. That's gonna be reserved for the higher-end chips and the overclockable ones that are at the top end, whereas the Ultra 3, Core 3, friggin' Why'd you drop the i? It's the best part of the branding. I don't get it. It's gonna be based on Raptor Lake, so it's it's gonna be back a generation, so it's not gonna get the full upgrade. But that's not supposed to launch this year. It's not supposed to launch until I think early next year is the plan for Air Lake, at least the more modest CPUs that are coming out. And that's also what we're hearing about the modest GPUs. AMD's RX 8000 RDNA 4 GPUs, according to the latest reports, will only be debuted at CES. So we're looking at something like the 8700 XT, 8800 XT, whatever they end up naming it, will be the highest end one and likely only debuted at CES. And according to this report, that the lower end models, the 8600 XT, will likely come out sometime in Q2. So if you're looking to upgrade to AMD, probably not this year. But what is happening this year is Apple is forced to allow third-party app stores on iOS. We've already seen this happen with several other companies, but now it looks like Epic Games finally got approval after Tim Sweeney, the CEO of Epic Games, the mega powerhouse behind Fortnite, decided to complain over on Twitter about how Apple was being arbitrary as to why they weren't getting approval. It turned out that the design of the install button was too similar to Apple's get or in-app purchases button. It could be confusing for end users, so they, they have to change that. Originally, Apple was going to make Epic Games change it before they were going to be allowed onto the App Store over in the EU, specifically. US people and otherwise in the world aren't necessarily forced in on this change, but now after Tim Sweeney complaining on Twitter, turns out that they will allow it, but are still asking for that button to change. So we'll have to see how this plays out. Obviously, Apple has been accused of violating the DMA. They're facing down the barrel of a 10% global revenue fine because of the violations that they already have, whether or not this Epic Games squabble is going to fall into that, where they could be found violating this. We'll have to wait and see. Is this a problem? Is this not? Is Tim Sweeney just yelling into the void again? Who knows? But Reese is going to yell into the void of your heart with deals. The hole in your heart is fixed by money. It's not. 
Yo, welcome back to EFT Deals, bringing the hottest tech deals on the internet. Happy Monday, everyone. Hope you guys had a good weekend and let's get your week started off with some deals. Because first up, we have this Acer Nitro 27-inch 1080p 180Hz gaming monitor for only $139.99, making it $110 off. But then next, we have the gorgeous NZXT H9 Elite ATX mid-tower case available in white for only $149.99, making it $90 off. But then if you're looking for something a little bit bigger with the same budget, you can get the Fractal Design North XL, which is a full tower EATX case for only $151.99, making it $28 off. And hey, with that, the deals are done. You can find these and more linked in the video description down below. But until next time, I'm gonna hand you off back to Brett for the rest of your hot news. Cheers. Well, Reese, if you want a banger deal on a crappy electric vehicle, turns out that the bankruptcy of Fisker is turning to be good for anybody who wanted to buy those, except for it's gonna be bought out by all one company. The previously $70,000 Ocean SUV is gonna cost $14,000 a pop and be bought by all one company. This is still pending approval by the judge in the bankruptcy court, but all 3,231 finished Ocean EVs are looking to be purchased by American Lease, which is a company that does ride hailing services over in New York for low emission vehicles. And so they would get a steal on the vehicle, have absolutely no support. We talked about last week how all of these vehicles have been recalled because their door handles might not work because they're supposed to pop out and then they might not pop out. And then you could be stuck in the car, you could be be stuck out of the car. Great stuff. No company to support it. No company to fix it. It was 14 grand. If it dies, who? Eh, they probably already made their money back. And I'm going to take my hope back from AMD because reports are coming out on the next generation 9000 X 3D CPUs. Turns out that the idea that we might get more 3D V cache on the higher end Ryzen 9 chips or potentially have them on all CCDs so you don't have to do any sort of core parking was just fantasy. It was just made up in our own brains. We were hoping for something that could have never actually come to fruition. Stop dreaming like that. Turns out, at least according to the reports, that the amount is just going to remain exactly the same as the current 7000 X3D series. So the 9950X3D, 9900X3D, and 9800X3D are looking at having a very similar V-cache setup, so nothing increased there, but according to reports like we talked about in last week's episode of Hot News, that the 3D V-cache chips might finally get manual overclocking to be pushed just a little bit further. Further. But we are still getting more benchmarks out of the Ryzen 9000 series before their anticipated launch at the end of this month. The 9900X is the next on the benchmark chopping block. And what we see is that it's about 20% faster than the 7900X if you turn on Precision Boost Overdrive or PBO, also known as Automated Overclocking by AMD. That's very good. If you don't have PBO on, that means that the 9900X is about 14% faster than the 7900X. But I will remind you that the 9900X has a lower TDP. It comes in at 120 watts as opposed to the 7900X 170 watts. So you're getting a faster CPU at theoretically less power consumption, making for a much more efficient chip. And it looks like this is gonna be a good CPU for people to pick up all around. But in case you picked up a Zotac product of some kind and then needed it to get RMA returned to manufacturer for them to fix it, they may have leaked your details. This is a bombshell report coming out from Gamers Nexus over the weekend where it was found that RMA details from customers who had tried to get their stuff fixed by Zotac was just leaked out on the internet, including name, phone number, email address, and potentially physical address, on top of also having details from companies and even employees and EI or social security number were involved in the documents. Now, when Gamers Nexus contacted them behind the scenes, it didn't look like Zotac replied to them initially, but within a day of this report going out, Zotac was able to cut the link that was in a Google sheet that accidentally had too many permissions shared. And so while you can find the RMA and warranty webpage that has the details, it doesn't link anywhere where you could get that information. So it does appear to be resolved at this moment. It appears that the way this happened was just, it was set to like anybody who has the link can access this stuff, which is bad privacy management and looks like it's been addressed, but that's not the only thing that Zotac's getting yelled at for right now. Them, Gigabyte, and ASRock also finding the ire of the FTC on their butts. And this is because of their warranty void if removed stickers that you can find on some of their devices, whether that's graphics cards, laptops, otherwise the FTC saying that those are illegal. In case you didn't know, the Magnuson Moss Act here in the United States makes it so that if those stickers are on your device, they are absolutely 
completely meaningless. You are allowed to open your device. You have the right to repair it. And so those are not okay. So they sent letters to those companies saying that they hinder the consumer's ability to perform routine maintenance and repairs on their products. I talked to somebody very recently that was trying to open up a device that they had and they said, hey, it has the sticker. What should I do? And I said, ignore it. You ignore it. That's not legal here in the US. We don't have to abide by that. And also placing those stickers on there is exactly why they're not allowed to be on there because somebody who doesn't have a full understanding of the right to repair law will see it and be like, oh no, they're going to get mad at me if I open up my device. So I should just send it to them and then have my details leaked all across the internet. Or, oh, I have to pay $100 because they scratched my device. This is a terrible time for all of us. So in case you need to hear this, vo royalty void if re removed stickers. <laughs> mouth is working just as well as those stickers should that you um you had you 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 could you do you you want they're not valid here in the u.s now i can't speak to every country on the face of the planet a lot of the devices that i saw in south africa have these stickers on there but again also don't fall under that but you're allowed to open up your devices don't let nobody tell you otherwise now if you break them more on the inside that's on you right like but you're allowed to tinker i'm gonna tinker with your comments from wednesday's episode of hot news big Thanks to everybody for letting me take the holiday off on Thursday. It was Independence Day here in the United States. Also took Friday off because there was hardly any news that came out due to the fact that everybody kind of took that time off. We're going back to Wednesday's episode now. We got 7G Studio saying, as a baguette enjoyer and a PC builder, I clicked immediately when I saw NVIDIA and the French flag in the thumbnail. Thank you, Reese and Michael, for your French flag thumbnails. Hold my phone and cat says, the confusing names that AMD and Intel has on their CPUs makes it easier for you to just accept you won't remember them and just buy them. But which one am I buying? Which, how do I buy, what What do I get? Who am I with an Ultra 3, i3, are they same thing? Ultra better, worse, gooder, I don't, I, brain broken. Hatsunari says, let's hope that Intel will improve the multi-thread without recalling the hyper-threading, which Wasp Media points out that I think they're just canceling hyper-threading for mobile parts where power draw and heat are concerned. So yes, this is something that was brought up uh, quite a bit. Like, um, I, I've seen a lot of people afraid that Intel's getting rid of hyper-threading on Arrow Lake. And be, when we were at Intel's tech tour in Taiwan, when we were discussing this, I actually went to the P-Core um, little breakout session that they had with the main engineers for the P-Cores. And one of the things he was talking about was that the decision to remove hyper-threading on Lunar Lake was a platform-specific decision, as pointed out here. Hyper-threading is a luxury, and it, it comes at a cost of, like, extra power, which you don't necessarily need, especially with the redefined e-cores when you're working on mobile. Can hyper-threading bring extra benefit? Does it increase IPC? Yes, that is something that Intel is very clear about. Hyper-threading actually still works. It makes your CPU faster in a lot of instances. But does it increase the IPC enough to justify the power consumption in a low power, low profile situation? They determine at least for Lunar Lake, no, it does not. So we're going to get rid of that and we're going to redesign the E-Core cluster and make that way more efficient and way more powerful to kind of offset the P-Core removal of hyper-threading. With Arrow Lake, when somebody asked about that specifically of like, will there be hyper-threading on Arrow Lake? They said that they couldn't comment because that's an upcoming architecture. That's not what we were there for, their the NDA, all that kind of stuff. But to reassure that the idea behind removing hyper-threading had nothing to do with Intel getting rid of hyper-threading overall. It had to do with them getting rid of it on Lunar Lake. And then Z-Shrink says, why would AMD's AI 300 be hard to remember? It's obviously for AI. And this is obviously their 300th iteration, or was it their 300th year in operation of a company? Oh shoot, that's the price point. I don't know. I don't know what it even means anymore. See you tomorrow for hot news.